Hey, thank you all for coming at this ungodly hour of the day. <laughs> Normally, I just uh, roll out of bed at this time. Um, I want to start by acknowledging Alexi before I do anything else, um, because a lot of the things I'm going to present today would not have been possible without her. Um, she's an amazing help that I'm fortunate to have. So basically, today I want to give you an update what we've been doing during the last year. Um, but perhaps more importantly, I want to tell you what we're about to do and why. And I'm hoping by doing that, they'll get some feedback that um, will help us improve what we do. And I also want to open up for collaboration. And I'm thinking here in particular about the uh, experimental plots, because some of you in this room know the, uh, <laughs> the extent that, of uh, resources that went in to establish them and maintain them. So I want to talk about the experimental design and with the idea that I want you to think about the treatments that we have um, so that perhaps you can use them to answer some of your questions. So some of you know, probably most of you, that I'm interested in invasion biology. Um, in particular, I've been focused on invasive plants and how they interact differently with soil microbes than native plants. And some of what Morgan touched on yesterday, I'm also interested in, in terms of changes in ecosystem function. Uh, so we've been working on that a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, but really the holy grail with invasion biology is to try to understand what allows about 10% of exotic plants to become invasive. And with the idea, um, the idea behind that is if we can understand why they become invasive, we might be able to predict um, who is going to become a pre uh, problematic invader. And then we could focus eradication efforts into those problematic <coughs> invaders. So there are several complementary approaches that we can take to better understand plant invasions. Um, one that has been used to some extent is the biogeography approach. And essentially what that is asking is, if and how these plants that come into our range differ in their native and exotic range. Um, and last year, we joined an ongoing collaboration um, taking this approach, and I want to give you an update of our work in Turkey, Montana, and Argentina. Perhaps a more common approach is to compare native and invasive plants. And essentially what that is addressing is how are invasive plants different from native plants. Um, and here I want to talk about ongoing and as well as upcoming work on MPG. The problem with that sometimes is that you end up comparing apple and oranges because the invasive plant might be an annual grass in terms of cheatgrass and it's invading a predominant um, forb community. It's very valid to do this approach because it's addressing what happens with invasion but it's hard to get at the underlying mechanisms. So to, to get at more underlying uh, mechanisms and to see, to ask if these invasive plants are fundamentally different from native plants, you can go and look at closely related native and exotic species. And we're quite fortunate, in a weird way, that we have Potentilla recta and two native Potentillas on the ranch. So here I want to talk about upcoming work that we're doing this year on MPG. So last year, um, we joined an ongoing collaboration, as I said, between Dean Pearson. He's here in Missoula. Most of you probably know, <laughs> know him. It's quite maybe unflattering picture, but it'll come back later and it'll all make sense. Um, and Oscar and Aaron in Turkey and Jose Hierro in Argentina. And what they started doing a couple of years ago was to do surveys along roadsides and native grasslands to quantify abundance of about 30 uh, plants that are native to Turkey but exotic in Montana and Argentina. And they essentially wanted to ask, do invasive plants actually become more abundant in their invaded range? Um, that is something that is the underlying assumption of a lot of invasion biology. But if you go into the literature, that is very rarely actually being quantified. And perhaps not surprisingly, they show that among these 30 plants, there were some that came to Argentina and Montana and became suppressed. They're in lower abundance here than they are in Turkey. 
There's another set of plants that simply undergo range expansion. So they're about the same abundance uh, here as they are in Turkey. And then there are these groups of problem invaders that just explode in abundance when they come here. The reason they chose Montana and Argentina is that the native grasslands are very similar. They're bunched grass dominated in both places. But more importantly, um, they also established an experiment. So in 10 locations in each range, um, they went out and found a native grassland that wasn't invaded in Montana and Argentina. And then they had a set of treatments. They had either a disturbance treatments where they disturbed the soil or not, or a seed addition where they added seed or not. And they focused on these 30 exotic plants that range in invasiveness from these surveys because that allowed them to look at the effect of disturbance and seed limitation for the success of these plants. Now, they hadn't actually included soil plant soil feedback in their original design, and Dean and I started talking, and it was something that could potentially increase the information that we gained from this experiment. And for me, it was very appealing, of course, because it's a replicated field experiment, and that's very rarely done innovation biology because most of the time we do our work in the greenhouse and uh, including autoclave or non-autoclave soil. And it also occurs in two exotic ranges. Now the problem was that um, I spent all of last spring getting permits to get the samples into the United States and while I was en route to Turkey, the Turkish government changed their mind from a tentative yes to a definite no to get samples out of Turkey. So they're very protective in Turkey because they have a really high biodiversity. So they've experienced researchers coming in and then taking the research out of the country and kind of not including Turkish scientists. Um, we are making progress slowly but surely to get those samples out of Turkey. And um, hopefully by next year, I'll be able to explain some of the data from these samples. So we have seeds, we have soil samples, we have root samples, but they're all in Turkey. What I was able to do when I was there was to establish an undergraduate collaboration uh, between a Turkish undergraduate, Birsan Karakas, and Natasha Boot, and she's here today. And what these ladies did was to focus on six um, plant species. Three of them are invasive in Montana, and they're on the noxious species list and three of them are not. And they went out and collected shoot biomass um, information and seed production on established natural populations. And she's gonna present on that today at around two, I think, right? Yeah, so you'll hear more about it then. I'm gonna give you a little teaser though. This is musk thistle, Cardius newtons. And just by looking at it, it grows much bigger in Montana than it does in Turkey. This is a picture I took in Turkey when I was there last year. It's a typical size of this thistle there. This is what we sometimes see on the ranch. It's quite spectacular, the difference, actually. Now, one uh, very popular hypothesis in invasion biology is the escape from enemies, the enemy release hypothesis. And basically what that say is that um, these exotic plants become invasive because they escape their natural enemies like herbivores or pathogens in their introduced range. And just looking at these roots, um, it's hard not to believe that that could be the explanation for this increased growth that we see in, in Montana. Um, these are biannual plants, so we collected them at flowering in both places. Uh, so two years old, and I don't know if it comes across really here, but you can see overall the fewer number of roots, and they are black here. Whereas in Montana, they're really white, numerous, and really healthy looking. So I'm really dying to get those roots and analyze them, because it's hard to imagine that that would not show up in differences in some kind of pathogen. Um, another thing I noticed was cheatgrass. Um, this could easily be taken in, really, in a really disturbed area on the ranch or around here, but I actually took this in Turkey. And um, so it just goes to show that this is a plant, it's a very disturbed area, it was a road construction, that this is a plant that really takes advantage of disturbed environments regardless of where it is. 
The difference in Turkey is that over time, where after disturbance, other plants will start coming in and start replacing cheatgrass. Whereas here, it seems like once it's in, it's really hard to get rid of unless you spray. Some of you have heard me talk about Ustilago bolata before. It's a cheatgrass seed pathogen, and it essentially it, um, eliminates seed production of cheatgrass. Um, you've probably seen it when you hike around in the field. It's these black blobs on cheatgrass. This is what it looks magnified. What I noticed when I came to Turkey was that I don't really see it, or I see it in really, really low abundance. So I, went, I started surveying cheatgrass populations, and I did seven, and I only found Ustilago in one of them. It is actually from there. It's a Euro Eurasian pathogen, um, and it was probably introduced in grain, just like cheatgrass was introduced. Um, but look at the invasion in, or infection in Montana. This is Natasha's data, and she surveyed 10 populations of cheatgrass in Montana. Overall, 40%, four of every 10 plant, was infected by Ustilago. So this is one example, I think, of a co-invader that thrives in the new range due to the release of its host. And you, could, you might ask, like, why, um, how is it possible that the host thrive when the pathogen is also here in really high abundance? Well, we can look at some data that Stacia collected uh, a couple of years ago. She was a, a high school student, actually, working with us. And what she did here was to go out and just survey um, abundance of Ustilago in the previous year. And then she counted the number of seedlings that emerged from underneath those um, uh, deceased plants. And as you can see here, it's essentially a flat line. So even though Ustilago infection ranged from like 10% almost up to 80%, there was no change in the number of seedlings. So that just goes to show that cheatgrass is not seed limited. So even if you have um, eight of every 10 plants infecting, infected and producing no seed, it will have no effect on the number of seed, seedlings emerging because the two ones that do produce seeds produce enough seeds to replace the, the the previous year seedlings. Another thing that has um, um, shown up in these surveys in two ranges is that overall it seems like Montana grasslands are more invasive, uh, invasible than Argentinian grasslands. And so we have more invaders here and they seem to be more susceptible to invasion. One thing we were able to do was, um, you know, in Montana and Argentina, we collected soil samples from the 10 different locations, so undisturbed and disturbed soil. Um, so we decided not to wait for the turkey samples, just go ahead and analyze the Montana and Argentinian samples, and we just got the results last week. And basically what this shows is all the different variables that were significant between the ranges at a .05 level. And the one here, um, basically I just divided the Montana number with the Argentinian number. So any value that is num higher than one means that it's higher in Montana than Argentina. And just looking at that, it seems like soil organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, manganese, and copper are significantly higher in Montana grasslands and Argentinian grasslands. So is it possible that Montana grasslands are more invasible simply because the soil fertility is higher in our grasslands? Certainly there could be other reasons, like we might have more empty niches, you know, rainfall might be different, although it is quite similar between Montana and Argentina. But it at least allows us to start tracking what differs between the two ranges, and then we can do experiments possibly to, to kind of get at causation. One thing that differs quite drastically is lamb's quarters. Um, this is one of those weeds that we have in the garden here. You know, you can eat it. It apparently tastes pretty good. In Argentina, it invades native grasslands. Um, and this is actually the gray stalks here is lamb's quarters from last year. And they're taller than Dean. I've never actually seen lamb's quarters get that tall here. Although you said that the, in the corn they got to be pretty big. 
last year. The interesting thing with the lambs quarter is that it's sometimes considered a halophyte. And um, that means that it's a salt lover. And both potassium and sodium was twice as high in Argentina compared to Montana. Can this explain the difference, why it invades there and not here? It's hard to know, but again, it opens up some possibilities for experimentation. Aha, you didn't think I would have a bird in this talk, did you? Okay, what bird is this? Come on, you birders. Yes. I had, of course, to Google it because I have no idea what they look like. <laughs> We have house mouse, mice, we have bindweed. What do these species have in common? They all thrive in human environments. <clears throat> now there is a set of weeds that, that behave the same way. Again, bindweed, bindweed, prickly south thistle, and lamb's quarter. We find them in our gardens. They're pretty abundant there. But in these surveys that Dean and his colleagues have done, they don't really establish in native grasslands. Even if you disturb the soil and add seeds, they fail to establish. So there's something about this um, urban environment that allows them to thrive here, but not in the native grasslands. So we went out last year in the summer and collected soil, because we thought maybe there are differences in soil between urban and, and native soil. Um, so we collected soil from 10 native grasslands, the same grasslands we've worked in, and also 10 adjacent town locations, just empty lots and whatnot. And as you can see, this is an ordination, and you can see that we get two pretty good clusters, that these soils are different from each other. It's not too surprising in a way, but when we're looking at it, pH is higher, um, nitrogen is higher, phosphorus is higher, and sodium is higher. So of course we wanted to see, like, can that difference in nutrients explain why these paradomestic weeds do so much better in town environments? Of course, other differences, temperature and moisture. You know, it gets warmer earlier in town. Maybe moisture have runoff that you don't see in the native grasslands. But we wanted to do just a simple greenhouse experiment where we collected soil from these three, three of each. So we had three native soils, three urban soils, and we mixed them. And then we wanted to grow just regular invasive plants and those plants that are restricted to paradomestic environments. Unfortunately, as happens sometimes with research, one of these soils probably had, had, had been sprayed right before. So this is what plants looked like in that soil. So total herbicide damage. And we couldn't believe first, we're like, what's going on? We tried to replant, and they, they just curled up. And it actually took Lauren Waller to say, like, looks like herbicide. And we're like, oh, of course, it's herbicide. So unfortunately, we had to just throw that out. But um, we're thinking about maybe repeating it, adding competitors to try to get at the, the soil contribution in their different successes. So moving closer to home and adopting this um, approach, um, what are we doing on the ranch this year? Well, one thing that Morgan touched on yesterday was the experimental plots. Uh, they're going into their fourth year now, the ones that is above the orchard house. Um, this is one where we have monocultures of four weeds. It's cheatgrass, um, knapweed, spurge, and sulfur sinkifoil. And then we compare that to a mixed native community containing both forbs and, and grasses. We did a pretty extensive sampling the first year after the establishment, and that was part of that earth microbiome project that we did in collaboration with Sean Gibbons. So we measured soil respiration over the season, and we saw that, where's the pointer? Oh, here. here. We saw significant differences o over the whole season among the different plant communities. Um, notice that leafy spurge isn't included because some of you know with the biocontrol issue we had, we really couldn't get that established very well. So we chose not to actually measure soil respiration in those plots because it was such a spotty establishment. But as you can see, knapweed, really high respiration. Um, whereas sinkifoil, 
uh, and cheatgrass is lower. We also saw tremendous differences in plant productivity. That's often observed. Uh, invaders, as Morgan said yesterday, come in and they increase productivity. And we're still trying to figure out like, how, what allows them to do that. Um, but as you can see here, knapweed, 10 times more productivity actually than cheatgrass with native plants being on the lower end as well. This is from Morgan's thesis. Um, and uh, she took soil sample and looked at nitrate availability. And um, you can see here, here we did include spurge because she was able to sample just, just under spurge patches. So we felt pretty confident that that would reflect the plant community. And as you can see here, native and syncophile, really low nitrogen availability, whereas spurge and knapweed, significantly higher. So I'm actually 20 minutes into my, public, uh, my presentation. This is my first slide on our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. So what do we see in terms of soil microbial communities? Well, talking about, um, and when I say soil microbial communities, I'm really talking about mycorrhizal fungi, general fungi, although I don't have any data on that. To, well, I have some, actually. And then bacteria. So for those of you who weren't here last year and haven't heard me talk about mycorrhizal fungi before, there are this little obscure group of, of fungi um, called glomer mycota. They're incredibly common in nature, colonize 90% of all plant families, which have led to this uh, statements, plants don't have roots, they have mycorrhizae. It's an obligate biotroph, which means that it's completely dependent on the plant host to receive carbon, and in return, it gives the host um, increased access to nutrients and possibly uh, pathogen protection. It's very beautiful for those of you who haven't seen it before. This is a root. We have hyphae going into the soil. Normally you don't see it that, this way, but this is petri plate, so you can actually look at the hyphae going into the soil. And you have spores forming. Now, Normally you can't just pull up a root and see that it's mycorrhizal, so we usually stain the roots We're using this blue stain um, with the idea that the fungus take up more of the stain than the, the roots. Um, so these are all internal structures of the fungus inside the root, and that allows us to quantify fungal abundance. We did that uh, using a different technique. You can actually also take soil samples and look at AMF-specific lipids in the soil. We did that in the experimental plots after one year, and the big uh, surprise, perhaps, was knapweed. It had an increase, tenfold increase in AMF biomass within one year of planting. It maybe shouldn't come as a surprise because knapweed is highly colonized. It produced so much biomass in these experimental plots. So it's just a really good host that channels a lot of carbon below ground to these fungi. Another thing that uh, we did when Mike and I, where is Mike? He is not here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyway. Mike, uh, when we went to Sweden last year, we brought soil that had been frozen, uh, and then he used a new technique that they're ju they've just developed in Sweden, where they use uh, radioactive <coughs> tracers, so they can take soil samples and then they add a substrate that is radioactive, and then they can see you know, how many bacteria take that up, because you measure the radioactivity in the soil in bacterial biomass afterwards. So you only get the active bacteria, and you can do the same thing with fungi. So Mike did that. Um, these are the initial values. I think I forgot to say that in the previous slide. So we also, ha we also took soil samples when we established the experimental plot. So that's kind of the background value. It's good to see that in most cases, although you know, there was such big variation here, so we don't have much statistical power to look at differences. But in both cases, it was, it was especially for bacteria, it was lower. Um, whereas the big surprise was cheatgrass. Both for bacteria and fungi, we find that the highest activity of both bacteria and fungi with cheatgrass. And that really took me by surprise. The question is, is that because the soil was frozen? So we're hoping to repeat that this year and just ship soil to our collaborator in Sweden that is fresh. Um, so you don't go through that freezing step. As I said, we established a collaboration with the Earth Microbiome Project. Um, 
This is Sean Gibbons, some of you remember him. He was here a couple of years ago, um, Dan and Philip and I. Um, so as part of that big sampling we did on the ranch, we also sampled the experimental plots uh, to see if bacterial communities had changed uh, one year after planting. Um, this is what he sent me a couple of days ago. This is just basically all individual samples that we took in ordination space. Uh, as Peter said yesterday, uh, points that are closer together are more similar in terms of bacterial uh, community composition than plots that are further away or samples that are further away. And you can see they're colored based on plant community. It just looks like, it's hard to imagine any grouping here. Um, he says that we have significant clustering based on plant communities, but it's very weak. So if you look at the whole variation in this data set, we only explain 3% of the variation due to plant community um, composition. There are also some weak associations with soil pH, organic matter, nitrate, and sulfate. The amazing thing that blows me away is that we have over 6,000 operational taxonomic units in each plot. And what is an operational taxonomic unit? Well, you know, when we sequence, the, this is all based on sequence data. So it's hard to relate that really to species, but what we do is we cluster all the sequences based on 97% sequence variability. So that means that one OTU um, are all those sequences that are 97% or more similar to each other. It's, I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna say that we have more than 6,000 species here, but it's, it's a high number especially for someone that is working in usually low diversity mycorrhizal systems. So we can see after one year there might be some kind of organization based on plant community composition. And the interesting thing here is to go, what happens after four years, when we go in four years after we planted these, is that clustering gonna start to become clearer? Because then we can start talking about rates by, these different, by which these different variables change. Another trivia, <laughs> how many bacterial OTUs do we have on MPG Ranch from all the samplings we did? Guess? I'm not going to give away any chocolate because I already <laughs> ate mine, but come on. I guess we don't know yet. Well, from the samples we have, we do know. 10,000. Much higher. 30,000? Much higher. <laughs> that is one potential answer. <laughs> what he emailed me just yesterday was this, half a million. <laughs> half a million, we have half a million OTUs, bacterial OTUs. Stop laughing. <laughs> that was not supposed to be funny. Anyway, let's move on. Are we gonna go through each one? <laughs> not me, I tell you that much. Um, so again, as I said, an analysis will be repeated this year, which will allow us to assess rates by legacy buildup. Um, uh, we've talked about, Mary Rose and I have talked about potential of including pollinators. These are pretty small plots, but just walking out there, and I encourage anyone to do that when things are flowering, just to look at the different um, pollinator communities. Like sulfur syncophile, you saw this. It's just bees, whereas there were butterflies. It was so much greater diversity in the native plots, and I would love to be able to capture that and put some numbers on that. So as I said, one objective is to measure rates of legacy buildup, but um, once we feel confident that we have that, we're just gonna spray these plots and try to reestablish native communities and see if they really matter. Does it matter if uh, the previous community was a spurge community or cheatgrass community in terms of native reestablishment? And can we relate these different legacy effects to success of different plant functional groups, for example? We're also gonna have subplots with invasion, invaded, invasive plants there to look at invasion meltdowns. So last year, um, we established this huge um, experiment in the exclosures. Many thanks to the ranch crew. You were amazing doing that and maintaining that. And I'm hoping that this year it will be easier with them establishing so weeding will be less intense. Um, this is a collaboration with John Marin at UM. 
And it seems like whenever I get involved with John Marin, it's not 25 plots anymore. It's like 450 plots. Um, but it allow us to ask a lot of really interesting questions uh, with this. So basically, we included nine different native forbs. This is all forbs and three exotic forbs. And this, this started because I was kind of curious, when you go out on the ranch or where you go to grasslands, you see grass monocultures, but you rarely if ever see native forb monocultures that persist over time. But you do see that obviously with these invasive forbs. So basically the experiment is we have all these different species, they're grown either in monocultures, in dominant stands, which means that the dominant species in question is, has an abundance that is 10 times higher than the subordinate plant. Or they're grown in completely even communities. Same abundance of all of them. Or same number of plants, I should say. Half of the plots are disc controls, half of them are sprayed with fungicide. <clears throat> so what that allows us to ask is, is pathogen accumulation density dependence? dependent. And what that means is, do more abundant plants have more pathogens? Does it differ between native and exotic plants? That's what you would predict based on enemy release hypothesis. How fast are pathogens accumulating? And does it vary among plant species? Do plants differ in their susceptibility to pathogens? And of course, interactions between AMF and pathogens, because some of the important function that we think AMF provides is pathogen protection. So do we have a different AMF community in monocultures um, plots that we assume will have higher pathogen pressure than in the completely even plots? And then are subordinate plants less affected by natives than exotic dominant plants? I can say even after the first year with knapweed, yes, I mean exotic plants have an enormous impact on the subordinate plants, much so more than the native forbs. Um, one thing that I started thinking about that Rebecca and I talked about yesterday is the possibility maybe of using these plots to, to answer some of her questions in terms of phenology. Because the, the strength with something like this is that they all experience the same environmental conditions, right? So it's not driven by an elevation gradient and where you actually find these plants. They're all grown in the same plots and it's replicated. So I'm hoping we, if you can use some of that, that would be great. Um, so this year, we're basically just establishing some baseline data. We're going to collect soil for some feedback studies. Um, I'm hoping that one of Joshua's high school students will be involved in biomass um, measurements, maybe soil respiration. We are thinking about <clears throat> measuring soil nutrient availabilities for baseline data as well. So one thing we've been thinking about um, is also going down and just uh, in a level and just measuring um, differences of closely related species, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is hopefully going to be done by um, Rebecca Bunn and one of her interns again. Um, we're hopefully going to have a Western Washington student staying with us again this summer. Um, Rebecca. Durham sent me some data about, um, I mean, we know that P. recta is an invasive on the ranch. You can go out and you see these uh, persistent monodominant stands, whereas the Potentilla gracilis and glendulosa are pretty rare in communities. Obviously, it begs the question, what allows this invasive plant to do this, exotic plant, whereas the native plants that supposedly have very similar traits fail to do that? Just the numbers from the surveys you guys have done, P. recta is 10 to 20 times greater overall cover than the native potentillus. And uh, most importantly, they co-occur in some places on the ranch. So that allows us to go out and collect you know, co-occurring plants um, that supposedly experience very similar environmental conditions. The other thing is that two of the plant species are also grown in the experimental plots. So we can actually go out and, and look at under an experimental setting when they experience the same conditions. How do they behave? So here are some of the things that we're going to measure. If you can think of other things that we haven't considered, please let me know. I want to also give you an update of what we've been doing with Tordon. I presented this data last year. Um, 
And I got interested in this because we spray a lot of herbicides on the ground, but we have very little idea what's going on below ground. Um, so in order to address that, we selected three areas that have knapweed invasions and also grass-dominated native communities. In each location, we had um, knapweed invasions, as I said, grass-dominated natives. We sprayed three of them with tordon and then three of them with water. After one year, um, we went out and we surveyed the plant community. Um, and what we showed here, I'm just focusing on two species here, knapweed and bulbous bluegrass, poa bulbosa. First of all, knapweed, it's not present in the native plants, which is native plots, which is good. We wouldn't have chosen them if knapweed was there. We also see that by spraying tordon, this is knapweed tordon, native control, native tordon, knapweed control, knapweed tordon. So as you can see, by spraying the knapweed plots with tordon, we significantly reduced knapweed concentration. So spraying was effective. Um, what we also showed here was that it seems like by removing the knapweed, we increase the abundance of bulbous bluegrass. We surveyed the AMF abundance um, one year after uh, we sprayed using these lipids again. And we can do that because AMF fungi, well, buscomycorrhizal fungi, contain a very specific lipid. So by extracting the lipids in the soil and looking at the concentration of that, we get a sense for AMF abundance in the soil. You can see here that one year after spraying, by replacing a really good host, knapweed, with a really shitty host, this is Poa bulbosa, really shallow root system, poorly colonized, we see a reduction in AMF abundance. We collected soil one year and two years after spraying, and Morgan has helped us look at water-stable aggregates, because uh, one important function of AMF is that it can hold um, soil particles together and increase the aggregate stability. So we were curious to see if this reduction in AMF abundance in the knapweed tordon plots would also result in a reduction in uh, aggregate stability. Well, after first year, uh, what we saw was overall, knapweed, um, there was a significant difference in plant community. So knapweed, overall, sprayed or not sprayed, had a higher water-stable aggregate. Um, so a greater proportion of the aggregates were stable when dunked in water, essentially. So, but there was a trend here that made us curious, like what happens if we do it two years after spraying? So you have a shitty host for two years. Maybe the AMF abundance would reduce even further. And that is what we see. It's still not significant. It's close to significant when you do a pairwise test here. But we have a tordon effect after two years. What I expected, though, was to have an interaction here. So that you see a reduction in the knapweed plot, but you shouldn't see an interaction, or you shouldn't see a, a reduction in the uh, sprayed grasslands, especially if it's mediated by AMF. So it's an indirect effect that is driven by a shift in plant community composition. So we're really, we're really puzzled by this at this point. So what I'm hoping to do is go out three years after and see what happens then and see if we can resolve this. But I, I would argue what we've seen so far is that we apply herbicide, we see a shift in plant community composition. This results in an altered AMF abundance. Um, and then we're starting to see changes of um, variables that are AMF mediated, such as you know, aggregate stability, which is important for overall soil stability and also water infiltration. And then I'm also wondering, what are the consequences for restoration success and ecosystem function? So we can have these cascading effects from one herbicide application event that we don't often think about. It's just focused on the above ground. So that has also made us think about um, herbicides in general and whether or not the AMF can take up these herbicides and kind of distribute that among plants. Because we know that you have these common mycorrhizal networks that so we have the same fungus connecting multiple plants and they also extend quite far outside the root system. So can 
can hyphae essentially take up herbicides and increase the effect of herbicide on the plant host. And, and we started thinking about this because of this paper essentially that looked at allelochemicals and how those are distributed in this hyphal network among plants. So we have this system. They're um, mycorrhizal carrot roots. I know they don't look at all like carrot roots, but they are carrot roots. So we have hyphae here. It's that picture I showed you earlier with a black background. That's from these. So what Alexa did first was to look at and make sure that these roots are really sensitive to tordon. And we also had to kind of establish what concentration of tordon should we use in this system. Because it's obviously very different from when it's applied in the soil and you have soil mo microbes possibly breaking down some of the tordon, maybe not being directly exposed to the roots, whatever. So the first thing we did was just basically look at the response of tordon. And this is just percentage of field application rates of tordon. So what this uh, shows is that going down to 1% of what we normally apply out in the field kills the root. They don't grow at all. So we know that this system could be a really good one to address this question about herbicide transfer with hyphae. So the setup we're currently using, and I don't have any data today, but I'm hoping in a couple of months we will have data, is that you have this two compartmental system where you have colonized roots here, the hyphae cross into a hyphal compartment, you add the tort on here, and then you look at root viability on this side. So those are currently growing. Last thing I wanted to talk about is something that um, Rebecca and Philip and I have been working on, and that is uh, to get a sense of the role of mycorrhizal fungi in plant invasion. It's quite conflicting, the literature out there. We have papers like this, uh, invasive plant suppresses the growth of native tree seedlings by disrupting below ground mutualism. Essentially here, this is garlic mustard. It's a non-mycorrhizal plant. It's a really severe invader in the east, um, understory deciduous trees. So you have a non-mycorrhizal plant invading and basically not providing any carbon for the mycorrhizal fungi. AMF abundance decreases and that then affects native plants that are either trying to compete with the mustard or that you're trying to reestablish after you eradicated mustard. Other titles have been more direct, just mycorrhizal density decline in association with non-native plants. So this has led to this mycorrhizal degradation hypothesis. Um, again, I want to point out that often what these studies are based on is an invasion by a non-mycorrhizal plant into a very mycotrophic native community. On the contrary, we've shown here in these systems that you can have an increase in abundance and diversity with some invaders, like spurge and knapweed, for example. But we also show that knapweed in an area where it's not invasive, such as the West Coast, and an area where it is invasive, such as out on the ranch, is just as highly colonized and associating with a very similar mycorrhizal fungal community. So that kind of begs the question, what, what is going on? Can we see patterns in this? So one way to address this is to take a meta-analysis approach. And essentially what that is, is an analysis of analyses. So you go out and you look at all the published papers on mycorrhizae and plant invasion, and then you extract data from these published studies and you analyze that data. So we did that, uh, Rebecca, Philip, and I. Um, in all, we found 50 publications that we could use for this. Um, resulting in 300 trials, because uh, a lot of publications have multiple trials. They include multiple plant species and different sites, so you can, can in essence, use all that data. In total, we had 190 publications, but many of them we couldn't use because they were either reviews or they didn't include an, um, both an exotic and a native. And you need something to relate your data to. You can't just take absolute data because obviously colonization can be higher in certain areas just because it's higher. So you need, need to have can construct an, a ratio to analyze. So we basically had four questions. The first one, simple, are invasive plants predominantly non-mycorrhizal? That the literature seemed to 
to lean towards? And is root colonization different between native and invasive plants? Do native plants respond differently to AMF than invasive plants do? Do AMF alter the, alter the competitive interaction between native and invasive plants? And finally, do invasive plants affect the AMF community different, differently from native plants? We have some preliminary results for the two first questions, and again, they're preliminary. They might change slightly. Um, the first question, we actually had two approaches. One was to basically go and download the species list of all invasive, we have done both forbs and grasses, but I'm just showing you the forms. All invasive forbs that are listed as uh, invasive or noxious weeds in, uh, on this uh, website. So basically, all forbs that are on the invasive species list in North America. Then Catherine, uh, bless her soul, <laughs> went through Google's, Google Scholar's search to find publications on every species of these. Um, and she found information of 321, I believe, um, of those, basically just to see, are they mycorrhizal or not? Do we have any information about their mycorrhizal status? The results from that was that 91% of all those forbs that she found information on were mycorrhizal. In general, we think about 80% of species forming AM. So, you know, it may not be higher than average, but it certainly isn't lower than average. And I would say that mycorrhizal fungi, or lack thereof, is not a good indicator of invasive success. They are, if anything, predominantly mycorrhizal. In our meta-analyses, we used 144 trials to look and to just actually quantify this relationship. Are invasive plants more or less colonized than native plants? And here, again, we see there is a significant difference. Um, is it biological? I don't know, it's a pretty small difference, but because we have so many trials, we have pretty high power to detect differences. But if anything here, invasive plants are more colonized than native plants. So I would say that, well, the mycorrhizal degradation hypothesis is certainly true in some systems, but in general, it doesn't seem to hold up for all invasive plants. Finally, looking at the response, and to calculate the response, we basically just took the growth response when plants were inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi over the growth response when they were not. So here, a value of one would mean that they don't really respond to mycorrhizal inoculation. Here we used, we had a smaller data set because fewer studies actually looked at this. Um, but here we see the same trend, that invasive plants respond more positively to inoculations than native plants. Um, again, this is preliminary data, so it may change, but that's what we have so far. And I think overall what this shows is that we really need to start looking at traits. We can't just say that invasive plants do this or that because it really depends on who's the invader, who's being invaded. So I'm hoping with this that I've uh, given you a background of what we've been doing, what we are going to do, and the different scales we're working at. And uh, I would love your feedback and uh, collaboration on any of these things. Do you have any questions? <laughs>